of atomic scientists. And as part of that, they created something called the Doomsday Clock. Maybe you've heard of it. And that Doomsday Clock, it was intended to, to kind of point out that our world was, was, in, was headed towards kind of a chaotic ending. And so what they would do is they would set this clock at certain times. And, and when they first set it back in 1947... They, sent it to, they set it to seven minutes before midnight. And then over, over the years since then, they've adjusted it 24 different times. I think the longest it ever got for midnight was back in 1991 after the end of the Cold War where it got to 17 minutes before midnight. But over the last few years, they've adjusted it closer and closer to midnight. Back in 2020, they adjusted it to 100 seconds before midnight. And then they kept it there again this year in 2021. They do it in January of each year. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking what it does is it really points out the fact that, that in this world, we, we live in a world where people are full of panic, where they're full of fear. And, and there's a reason for that. I mean, this is a scary world in which we live. That doomsday clock, it's based on primarily on, on the possibility of nuclear war and on climate change is where they come up with all this stuff. But there's a lot of scary things out there. And that's probably even more true over the last year and a half with the COVID pandemic, that there is a reason to, to live in fear with this world, especially if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And, and, and what really troubles me the most is that, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of Christians have gotten caught up in that as well. There are a lot of Christians who unnecessarily live in, in panic and in fear in this world. And you can see evidence of that all around us. I mean, the same people who are a little over four years ago claimed God showed up when their, their candidate got elected. Now they're running around wringing their hands and acting as if God is not sovereign anymore. Or I think about all the people who are, are putting out all these different theories out there. They look at the events of the day and they say, oh man, that means Jesus is coming again soon. But then they turn around which is amazing to me, and they say, hey, let's try to stop this. I mean, if Jesus is coming back, I don't know about you, but I don't want to stop it. Just this week, not surprisingly, a lot of you know we had a, a lunar eclipse this week, right? And so I wasn't surprised at all that earlier in the week, all these social media posts show up and talk about the fact that in the Bible there's all these prophecies that talk about a blood moon that are connected to the return of Jesus. So therefore, when the eclipse happens this week, Jesus is going to come back. Now, it is true. In the scriptures, there are prophecies that associate a blood moon with the return of Jesus. That's true. But it's also true that on this earth, somewhere on this earth, there are at least two lunar eclipses every year. And the supermoon eclipse like we had this week, they happen every three or four years. So what that means is since Jesus rose to go and be with the Father, that there have been thousands of blood moons, quote, over the years. And Jesus still hasn't come back yet, right? And I think that's just this, this evidence of, of how scared people are, and even Christians, and how they, they get wrapped up in trying to predict, you know, when Jesus is coming back. And this morning we're going to see that not only do we not need to fear his return, but we ought to look forward to it. We saw that last week, and we're going to continue kind of with that theme today as we continue in our study of 1 Thessalonians. We're in this series now, we're in the next to last week of this series that we call Living in Light of Eternity. We've been looking at Paul's letter to the church there in Thessalonica, a letter that he wrote to encourage the believers there on how to live their life lives in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back. Now Paul, as we saw last week, and all the people, they, they expected it was actually going to happen in their lifetime, that it was going to happen soon. And that didn't happen. It hasn't happened yet. But, but he writes to them here about how they're to live in light of the fact that Jesus is coming again. And so it's so relevant for us. I, I think I don't know about you, but I'm finding stuff that's relevant for my life every week here. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out to 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to read this morning beginning in chapter 5 in verse 1. We're going to look at the first part of this chapter, and then next week Ryan's going to close out our series as he looks at the last part. Here's what Paul writes. 
Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. He gives us some some really encouraging words here, doesn't he? And and as we're going to see here, Paul, he's writing for a specific purpose. We saw last week that he was writing to answer one of the concerns that the people there in Thessalonica had. They were concerned that, that since Paul had left there, that some of their loved ones had died, and they knew the day of the Lord was coming. They knew that Jesus was coming, and they were worried about what was going to happen to those people when Jesus come, were, were they going to miss his return? And as we saw last week, Paul, Paul made it really clear, not only were they not going to miss his return, they were going to take priority over everyone else. In fact, their souls and their spirits were already in the presence of Jesus, and when he came, he was going to bring those souls and those spirits back with him, and their bodies would be the first to rise out of the grave. So they didn't have anything to worry about at all. And now in this section, he's, he's writing to answer another question. Well, if that's true, then when is, the, when is this going to happen? When is Jesus going to return? And as we're going to see, Paul never really answers that question. Because as we're going to see this morning, that's not even the right question for us to ask. Now, before we, before we get into kind of the details, I want to give you some overall picture of this, of this passage. A couple of things that we see here. The first thing that we see here is the fact that, that Paul was certainly familiar with the teachings of Jesus about his return. Even though Paul hadn't been present there with the disciples in the, the hours before his death when he told them about his return, he certainly was familiar with it. He uses the same phrases, the same terminology, the same, the same examples that Jesus himself had used. In particular, we're going to see here that Paul talks about Jesus' return being like a thief in the night. Same thing that Jesus said. We're also going to see that he's going to talk about staying awake and being alert for that return. Jesus talked about that too, and we're going to see that a little later on as we go through this passage together. So, so he's, he, he was intimately familiar with what Jesus had taught, even though he hadn't been present with him. The second thing we see here is that there's these sets of contrasting words here. And what Paul is doing for us, he's contrasting these two distinct groups of people. And these two distinct groups of people, when Jesus comes, they're going to be treated completely differently. And so he's trying to distinguish between these two groups. Now, while we're here on this earth, those two groups, sometimes they're really hard to tell apart, right? Sometimes we look the same on the outside. Sometimes people on the outside can look great, but on the inside... They don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he uses these contrasts. So I'm going to ask you to actually help me fill in the blanks here with these contrasts. I'm going to kind of give you the negative part of it, and then I'm going to see if you can go ahead and fill in the positive part. So here's the first one. He talks about those who are unaware. So what would be the positive one of that? Aware, yeah, just take the un off there. Okay, so... There's the distinguish. The second one there is destruction. He says some are going to go to destruction. So what's the opposite of destruction? This one's not, maybe not quite as obvious. What do you think? Okay, that's close. Construction, yeah, that, that's kind of close. 
I think it, in this sense, it's probably salvation is what he's talking about here. That some are going to go to salvation, some will go to destruction. Here's the third set here. He talks about darkness. This one, Josh, I know you got this one. Light, that's right. That light, there's this difference between dark, darkness and light. How about this next one? How about night? What's the opposite of night? You guys get this one? Haley. Day, yep. All right. You weren't too sure about that. You didn't seem like. And then what's the next? The next one here is asleep. What do you think, Jonathan? Awake. awake. Yep, absolutely. Asleep and awake. Or non-sleeping. <laughs> I suppose that's true. Sound now like my wife who makes up all these words when we're playing uh, words play. That she just puts un or re in front of everything and makes up words. So. Uh, how about drunk? Sober, yep, that one's pretty simple. We're going to talk a little bit more in a moment about what, what Paul meant there. Um, how about wrath? We've already used it one other time. We're using it twice. Salvation, yep. And then the last one, no, maybe there's a couple more. Uh, death, life, yep, that one's pretty simple. So, so there's these two contrasting groups of people. And what Jesus returns, what Paul is saying here is you'll be able to tell them apart because their end is completely different. Some of them are going to be saved. Some of them are going to face God's wrath. And so when we take all that and we put that together, we can really see the main idea here that Paul is trying to get, get to us or to teach us in this passage. And here it is. Knowing how to live in the light of Christ's return is far more important than knowing when he will return. That knowing how to live is far more important than knowing when he will return. See, what, what, what Paul is really saying here, he's saying that asking when Jesus is going to return that's not even really the right question. I mean, none of us know that, right? None of us can know, know when Jesus is returning. He says, so here's the question you should be asking. How should I live knowing that Jesus is going to return? That's really the question that, that we need to ask here is how should I live? That's what the whole letter is that Paul has been writing is about that. He talks here about something called the day of the Lord. And um, that's a phrase we see throughout the Old Testament prophecies, right? We've looked at that before in the past. It's used three times in the New Testament, including right here. You'll see a similar phrase used elsewhere in the, uh, in the New Testament. And when he's talking about that, he's not talking about a 24-hour period of time. He's talking about this season of time. When God is going to come back to intervene in history, he's going to judge his enemies, he's going to deliver his people, and he's going to usher in a physical kingdom. That's what the day of the Lord is all about. That's why Paul here, he writes about, notice, times and, and seasons. And what he's telling us here is that, that no one can know exactly when Jesus is going to come back. No one knows exactly, we're not even going to probably know exactly when the, quote, day of the Lord begins because it's just this period of time that happens here. And Paul knew the words of Jesus. He knew that even Jesus had told us that nobody's going to know when he comes back. Here, here's what Jesus said about, about his return. He doesn't even know. He said, but concerning that day and hour, he's speaking of the day of the Lord, not even the angel, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. And so there's no way we can know exactly when that happens. Now, now Paul's going to tell us here, yeah, you ought to be awake, you ought to be alert for that. He says, for those who don't know Jesus, it's going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to take them by surprise. And when that happens, their fate is going to be sealed for eternity. They're not going to have a second chance to turn around and to, and to put their faith in Jesus, which is why time after time we tell you, if you've never done that, you need to do it today because tomorrow might be too late. Jesus might come back moments from now. He might come back this afternoon. And when that happens, it's going to be too late. He says, but if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're one of his disciples, it shouldn't catch you by surprise. You ought to at least know it's coming. And the example he gives here is really good. He gives the example of a pregnant woman. Now, 
In this day and age, maybe this example's not quite as good as it was in Jesus' age, because what do we do now? We, we schedule our C-sections, and we schedule when we're going to be induced to go into labor a lot of times. But for the, the women that don't go do one of those things, think about it. They know when it's getting close to time for their baby to come, but they don't know the exact hour. They don't know the exact time. And so what do they do? As the time gets close, they begin to get ready and they begin to prepare for that. And that's what, what Paul is telling us here. You need to look around. You need to see the seasons. You need to understand that his return is close and you need to get ready for that. And so what's more important than knowing exactly when that's going to happen is knowing how to live as we await his return. And so in this passage here, he's going to give us four commands that tell us how we're to live as we await Jesus' return. And each of those four commands tell us something about how we're to live. The first thing that we need that know that we need to do is that we have to stay alert. That's why he says in, in verse 6 that you need to keep awake. Paul has used this idea of uh, sleeping. He used it, we saw last week, to refer to someone who had died. Well, it's interesting in this passage, other than verse 10, where he uses it again to describe someone who has physically died, he uses a different word for sleeping here. And um, it's a word that, that really describes those who are, are spiritually asleep, those who no longer understand sin and the consequences of sin. And what he's saying for us here, he's saying that you need, to, you need to stay awake. That verb to stay awake there, it literally means to be roused from your sleep and be mentally alert. I guess for me, that would be probably after my first cup of coffee, maybe for some of you too. But it's the idea of being, being alert to what's going on all around us, seeing those things and, and seeing the things that are going on in the world and understanding that Jesus is coming soon. <clears throat> And it's interesting, Jesus uses exactly that same verb to warn us about his coming. It's translated a little bit different, but here's what Jesus said. He said, watch, it's the same verb that's, that's translated keep awake here in Thessalonians. Watch, therefore, for you, you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, this idea of watching, it doesn't mean that we look at the things all around us and that we're trying to figure out when Jesus is going to return, that we're going to predict when he's going to come back, that we're trying to put it all in a chart. What it means is that we see these things and that we're awake and we understand that Jesus might be coming soon and so that we're vigilant 24 hours a day. We're watching to see what's going on and see, see how those things fit in. Uh, and I truly believe that as these things begin to happen, when Jesus is about to return, that those of us who know the scriptures, we're going to begin to see those things and go, ah, that's what he meant. Kind of like at the, his first coming. You know, most of the people didn't really understand what that was going to be like, but when they saw it happen, the ones who were vigilant, the ones who were spiritually awake, they began to see those things. And I think that's what's going to happen for us too. The second thing that we're to do here, the second command tells us that we're to, to be level-headed. Twice in this passage, Paul tells them to be sober. <clears throat> now that verb there, it literally, it literally means not to be drunk. I mean, that, that's what it means, not to be intoxicated with liquor. But what's really interesting is that, that every time that that verb is used in the New Testament, it really deals more with um, a mindset than it is with just the physical act of drunkenness. And it's really referring to anything that would attack our minds and that would draw us away from the truth. So it's, it's actually translated sober-minded in most of the places where we find it in the New Testament. And so what he's telling us here is that we need to, we need to be level-headed. We need to not be carried off here and there by every wind of teaching, as Paul writes about, about elsewhere, that we're to, we're to make sure that, that, that we look at these things and we're not drawn off to the extremes. I think it would be very similar if not the same as being self-controlled that we find is is part of the fruit of the spirit and so we uh we need to understand that to be level-headed and i think jesus again he 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 spoke to this in the scriptures about this idea jesus answered them and said see that no one leads you astray 
For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ, and they will lead many astray. That's the idea that, that there are going to be people out there going, oh, here's Jesus. He's coming back again. Look at, the, look at the lunar eclipse. Jesus is coming back again. And the idea is that we want to look at those things through the, through the eyes of the Scripture, and we need to pray for discernment so that we can understand those things, and we need to be level-headed and not carried off on all these tangents here and there that would draw us away from a life that is to be lived for Jesus because that's really what matters. The third commandment, the third way that we're supposed to live here is that we're to give comfort and exhortation. That's why he says they're to encourage one another. And that word encourage, it's the, the same word that describes the Holy Spirit as our comforter. It literally means someone, it, someone who comes alongside of someone else. And what that's telling us is that that's what we're to do. We're to come alongside, that we're to, that we're to sometimes to give comfort. That's, that word is wrapped up in there. But sometimes it also means that we're to exhort people. We're to, we're to cause them to want to live in a way that would be holy and pleasing to God. My kids were smaller. They were learning to ride their bikes. And so they started out, obviously, like most kids do, and they put training wheels on their bike, right? But then there came a point where they were ready to get rid of the training wheels. But I didn't just, like, roll them down the driveway and say, hey, now you're on your own. What would happen? I would hang on to their bike while they were riding it. I would be alongside them. I would be their paraclete, their encourager. And I would hang on to that bike, and they would begin to ride. And, and eventually, when I knew that they were able to do that on their, on their own, then I would let go, and they would ride on their own. And that's the picture of what we're to do here spiritually. We're to come alongside our brothers and sisters. We're to, we're to hold them up. We're to teach them. We're to exhort them. We're to comfort them. With the goal being that at some point they will mature to the point where they can live life on their own. But that doesn't mean we just leave them there. We continually do that over and over. But we're to give comfort and exhortation. Finally, the last thing he tells us here is that instead of pointing an accusing finger, I am to give a helping hand. That's this idea of building one another up. I have a really dear Christian friend. And lately, it's kind of broken my heart because it seems like he's been really into criticizing other Christians and to criticizing the church a lot. And it breaks my heart because this particular person, he is someone who is really gifted and who could be used greatly by God to build up the church, but instead he's using it to always point a finger at someone else. And that, that's really kind of sad to me because that's not what we need, what we need. I mean, think about it. The Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. And if we're constantly criticizing the bride of Christ, how do you think that makes Jesus feel? I know how I feel when somebody accuses or points a finger at my bride. It doesn't make me very happy, and I don't think it makes Jesus very happy when we're constantly doing that. Now, is there a time when someone is in sin that we need to come alongside them and we need to rebuke them and help to restore their relationship with Jesus? Absolutely. In fact, we're commanded to do that. But I think far more often what we need to do is to come along and build one another up. The verb here literally means to build a dwelling. And in a spiritual sense, that's what we need to do. We need to come alongside each other and help each other and build each other up rather than constantly putting other people down. So we've seen this morning that knowing how to live in the light of Christ's return is far more important than knowing when he will return. And I think every single one of us this morning need to respond to that in some way. There are a lot of you here who have already put your faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm glad for that. And I'm going I'm to come back and I want to talk to you in a moment about, about how you can live. And maybe some actions that you need to take in light of what we've learned this morning. But first, I want to talk to those of you who may have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been trying, like I talked about earlier with the kids, you've been trying to do things on your own. You've been trying to be right with God on your own, and, and that just hasn't worked out. And the fact is, it never will work out. 
Because the only way that we can be made right with Jesus is through faith in him. You see, Jesus loved us so much that he knew we could never do it on our own. So he came and he died on the cross. He loved us so much that he died on the cross. That, that cost him everything so that we could have a relationship with him. So that we can make sure that we're one of those people who rejoice and have hope in the return of Jesus Christ. And he offers that at a great cost to himself, but it's a free gift to us. But the only way, the only way we can receive that gift is by putting our faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so if you've never done that, like I said earlier, you need to do that today. Jesus could come back at any time. And when he comes back again, it, your fate is going to be sealed for eternity. You're going to be one of those people that are in that group that's defined by death and by, by wrath. And you're going to have a date with God's judgment and wrath, and it's one that you can't get out of. So please, I beg of you, if you've never put your faith in Jesus before, please do that today. Now, for those of you who have already done that, and I believe that's most of the people that are joining us today, I just want to encourage you today to think about how you can take and, and do some things that are very practical to apply the things that we've learned today. I want to think you to think about what are some things that I can do to stay alert and awake? What can I do to be watching for the return of Jesus and make sure that I'm ready when he returns? I want you to think about what are some things that you can do to give comfort and to give exhortation, maybe to someone else who is struggling in their walk with Jesus right now. I want you to think about what can I do to build someone else up? How can I quit pointing fingers at, at someone else and instead do something that would build them up? How is it that I can be level-headed? How can I make sure that I don't get carried here and there by, by all this different stuff, all this different noise that's out there all around us every day? And as you think about that, as you pray about that, as you consider that, I'd encourage you to just write down what God brings to your mind. Find that's one of the great ways that we can make sure that we actually put into practice those things that, that we're learning from God's Word. Fact is, Jesus is returning one day, maybe today. And for those of us who have faith in Jesus Christ, that ought to be the most encouraging thing. It, might, it ought to be the, the things that gives us the most hope of anything in the world. We shouldn't be afraid of that. Do we live in a scary world? Absolutely. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we should never live in panic, Jesus. And Father, I know there's nothing I can say that would convince them to do that. That can only happen if you draw them to yourself. And I'm it out right now.